And once I get the notice, all right, we are live. Hello, everyone, my gentle and modern apes. I am here with Jonathan Baker. He is a geoscientist. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about geology, and we are also going to be busting a little bit of young earth creationism. So you guys know me. I've, <laughs> I've been around on the channel a couple of times since I, uh, since I run the channel. But I don't think anyone here has actually met Jonathan before. So Jonathan, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick? let everyone know kind of kind of uh, what you're into uh, academic experience etc sure um, yeah like you said so right now I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher uh, I'm a geoscientist but uh, more focused uh, I use isotope geochemistry to study study paleoclimate reconstruction so that's that's mainly what I do now um, I uh, did my excuse me? Did my graduate work uh, here in Las Vegas and doing postdoctoral work with the institution in China. Uh, and most of my research, like field wise, is uh, focused around uh, Russia and neighboring regions. So I'm interested in reconstructing climate, uh, you know, all across the Eurasian continent. Uh, it's many dynamic systems and such. I. I had always, well, I, I had an interest in geology since high school, I'd say. Originally, I wanted to be a biologist. I had a strong interest in in research biology, you know, not, I wasn't interested in going to med school or, or something like that. And I got to college and, and I started along that degree path and realized that almost everyone else there wanted to go to med school or dental school or something like this. And the atmosphere was terrible. I, I really hated it. Uh, it felt like everybody around you was like, wanting you to fail and uh, so they can get ahead in, in the class ranking, whatever it may be. So it, it, yeah. it wasn't very fun for me. Um, I still do have an interest in those things academically, but uh, geology was a lot more exciting. It was thrilling. And just, just from a curiosity point of view, uh, there seemed to be a lot of unanswered questions or, or ways I could thrive as a researcher, you know, or things I could dive into as a researcher. We, we, the, the more uh, you might hear a professor say, we, we don't know, we don't know enough about this. Uh, that to me was more exciting. Felt like the field I wanted to be yeah. in. To to I totally agree with you. I, um, in, in my own undergrad experience, I, I kind of had the same, the same um, observation that the, the folks who were there, I was in um, pre-professional animal science. So a lot of folks were pre-vet. And uh, mm -hmm. in my bio classes, there were a lot of pre-med folks, pre-dental folks. And I noticed the same thing. It, it wasn't really learning for the sake of learning. Like, ah, this is very interesting and I'm glad I'm here. But it was like, I need the credit. <laughs> so check that bad boy off the list and, and move on down the line. And you know, everybody has a couple of classes like that. But I, I very much enjoy, uh, similar to you, the, the attitude in academia that's like, look at how little we know. Look at how much we know. Um, let's learn more. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... You have a website called Age of Rocks, and that I, I found you through a geology friend, but you've been running Age of Rocks for quite some time. You want to tell us a little bit about Age of Rocks? Um, sure. I mean, it, it started just as, as a personal thoughts thing. I, I was thinking through, uh, let me, well, let me back up. I, I'll say, first of all, the first geology book I ever read, and this was in the mid-90s, uh, was... Uh, Grand Canyon Mon Monument to Catastrophe, written by Steve Austin, who at the time I think was with uh, us. Yep. And, yep. and this book uh, <laughs> was, it was written to show that if we look at the basic geology of the Grand Canyon, it's consistent with the notion that uh, most of geological features can be explained by uh, a global flood in a fairly recent past, right? So right. in retrospect, I mean, now, now I think back on that book and look, look through it, I still have it somewhere. <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's not a bad introduction to basic geology and sedimentology and stratigraphy in particular. Uh, he knows, I mean, he, he understands those subjects. And that's, uh, yeah, that, that was key for its success, I think. Because if you read it, uh, especially if you're raised in that worldview or if, if for whatever reason it might be enticing to you, uh, he does a good job of explaining the basics and try to create this plausible looking scenario whereby those layers in the Grand Canyon, if you could stand and look from a distance, you say, well, 
yeah, I think I can see how this could be formed back and forth, uh, you know, really deep waters covering the surface of the earth. I mean, this makes sense yeah. to me. I can, I can, I think he knows what he's talking about. Uh, so I, I kind of got interested in geology that way. I, I had read, I mean, most likely I've read a book if, if people here grew up with uh, that mentality books by uh, Henry Morris and, and uh, Baumgartner and Snelling and Ord and uh, a number of others, you know, who oh, yeah. have, yeah, we're really well known. So so I'm definitely familiar with all those arguments put in place. Now, I wasn't raised in this worldview. I had a lot of friends uh, close to me uh, who were, and they were very, very much driven by Ken Ham and his uh, various organizations, what would become Answers in Genesis. It wasn't quite there yet. So going in, you know, when I went through my geology degree, I kind of, I tried to go in the way that Henry Morris would advise me to to like to see the world as uh, having evidences that we interpret through this lens and this lens and, and maybe test competing hypotheses and that seemed fair enough I mean we do that in science we test competing hypotheses and we understand that with gathering evidence um, one that didn't seem plausible may end up becoming quite plausible and and, and we confirm it through various studies and so I, I tried to go in with this open mind and uh, not in an effort to convince everybody else that this this is how you should think but um you know go especially on the field trips i would try and look at these details and think back like okay well here's what i understand from the textbook geology here's what i understand from uh somebody like steve austin so how might we interpret this both ways and the, and it didn't take too long to realize that that was just it, it wasn't a compete like it, it wasn't a fair competing hypothesis mm -hmm. scenario i mean there, there was there was a, a, a hypothesis with evidence, and there was a hypothesis that just didn't match reality at all. Uh, but that wasn't easy to see, as say like a high schooler who had an interest in this, was willing to read a book by Steve Austin, you know, who, who does again a great job of explaining the basics of geology and trying to help people understand how, my, how that might uh, support his flood geology point of view. So in retrospect, I thought, well, the best way to learn any topic is to teach it by far. And, you know, I got that experience as a grad student teaching intro classes, um, but this seemed more interesting. Like I could write about topics like radiocarbon dating and do so in a way that's not just a textbook explanation, but try to write about it uh, with keeping in mind the way that young earthers would uh, propose their various other models, ways to explain how radiocarbon dating could have the results it does if the world isn't so old, right? Uh, yeah. so, so I tried to explain concepts in geology in response to claims made by flood geologists and young earth creationists. And uh, that way help people who might be in that scenario, you know, whatever their age, uh, people who didn't get to go through a bachelor's in geology, let alone 10 more years in grad school, which is been so much fun. Let me, tell you. Um, you know, if, if you didn't get that experience and you don't get to go uh, see all the evidence firsthand, whether in the field or the laboratory, then um, it may not be easy to distinguish between these two alleged worldviews or hypotheses, uh, these, these two frameworks. So I tried to, you know, help people in that scenario understand better all the details, because when you get down to the details, it's just doesn't work at all. You have to leave it vague for it to even look plausible. And I mean, organizations like Answers in Genesis are absolute experts at communicating in this way. Um, they leave topics vague when it's in their favor and they try to be overly technical when it's also in their favor. You know, so they'll explain it at a very elementary level so that people think I can, un I can understand this I get it. It it looks like it could work, and, and if they're challenged, you know, for some, for example, you know, people who are researchers in radiocarbon dating and who run, you know, the top labs in the country, when they come back and write this long response, which they did, uh, to explain why these guys are misusing their data and their and their papers, uh, then Answers in Genesis will respond in this jargon-heavy article 
mm. it's got all kinds of figures and, and explanations that nobody can understand who's reading their website. And then the readers will look at that and say, oh, these, these guys really know what they're talking about. Like, they're serious scientists. And I don't need to understand yeah. this article. I just need to trust that they do. Uh, so it can be very frustrating because their communication is so effective. And it's it, hard to it, know. Oh, so sorry. Continue. Okay. There's, a, there's a, as, as a quick, quick note from the, from the side chat, first of all, thank you everyone for being here. I'm really excited for the chat that we're about to have. They're saying we're buffering a little bit. How's your Wi-Fi in that room that you're in? Is it okay? Uh, it's okay for me. I see you clearly in. Yeah, you're you're doing you're doing well for me too. Maybe maybe it's a Streamyard YouTube thing. I I've noticed that as well, and it's it's very funny the um the difference between AIG responding to folks that are in the field versus laymen. And generally, I get the I get the feel from them that they um that they expect their audience to be like oh. AIG has responded and that's good enough. And that's the only that's the only thing AIG is worried about is is the image of does it look like we've got a dog in this fight? Not so much this um this concept of rigor and actually addressing the problems that are brought forth to them. Like say you were submitting a, a paper to peer review and they were like, we're not gonna submit this until you clear up this, 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 and this. For them, mm -hmm. it's it's more of a uh, do we how do we look? <laughs> how are we looking? Yeah. Yeah, so it can be oh, frustrating man. to know, so, like, how do you communicate with that, uh, well, with that strategy yeah. being employed. Uh, it, yeah, it, it's very difficult. And and this is just one topic. I mean, I, if, if you're somebody that has, it's just very new to the idea of a uh, young earth creationism, you, you didn't experience it growing up or much uh, in life, then... I mean, it, it may appear as like some side fringe conspiracy theory or, or something like that. And uh, right. the way that they communicate is, it has a lot in common. Um, and and I, I don't want to be reductionistic. I mean, and young earth creationists are not the same as flat earthers. They're not the same as a number of other fringe uh, groups out there. Uh, there is a difference, but their overall strategy and, and the way they do this is, is quite similar. And I think a lot of groups have borrowed from them to make their communication more effective, especially in, in today's world. Uh, and, and a lot of that is finding just a handful of experts that people can trust. Um, and they find somebody with a legitimate PhD who's published legitimate works and somebody like Steve Austin and, and Snelling, they have, uh, they, they published in the past. They're not really active researchers or publishers, but that's okay. I mean, they've, they've got a degree, they understand the material uh, and so forth. So they'll take these um, experts and then they'll write a, a host of articles. And to an extent, the content of those articles doesn't matter that much. All, all that matters is that they're posted and they can always say, we have respond to this. We know, we know about that objection. We've already yeah. critiqued it. And as long as it's there, yeah. uh, a lot of people just say, "Let's." I'm satisfied. I, I don't need to look into it into much detail. They've done it for me. Ab absolutely, and I think I think too that it's it's quite interesting to me that they'll that regularly some of the folks that work at say AIG, for instance, um, creationists get to be jacks of all trades, right? They're they're comfortable carting anyone out with letters behind their name to discuss many different kinds of topics. Georgia Purdom will regularly get up and talk about uh, geology or genetics when um, mm -hmm. that's that's not typically geology isn't her realm, you know. And I I think that it's interesting too because, for instance, in the uh, I don't know if you know Nathaniel Jensen, he wrote a book called Replacing Darwin. He's an AIG guy, mm -hmm. and um, in 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 his book, he's discussing mutation rates. And in his discussion of mutation rates, he argues that mutation rates should be considered to be something that is constant. Now, mutation rates aren't constant. They, they vary quite a bit. Um, but his reasoning for that was because secularists, quote unquote, use constant rates for the speed of light and for the decay of radioactive elements. Um, yeah. And my reaction to that was... Those are not, you can't just apply that unilaterally across whatever you want. There, there are reasons why 
um, people in given fields do what they do in order to get the most robust answer, the most consistent, uh, consistently accurate predictions. And um, that minutia, I feel, is what's missed so often, like like we were discussing earlier, um, in, in kind of creationist circles. And I, I mentioned this to you, but I, I kind of want everybody uh, here to, to hear it as well, because you mentioned it in uh, your testimony on on um, on Old Earth Ministries. But mm -hmm. a lot of geology is just simply overlooked by young creationism. They they don't care about the minutia unless it potentially could help their point. And because of that, they they miss out on this awesome big picture that that really can inform uh, the past. Conformous of, of the beat, which is quite romantic on one hand, but it's it's also uh, concerning to say. Um, so you work with the Quaternary period, yes? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, well, currently, yeah. Uh, when when I started my grad degree, my my master's degree, um, I was fascinated by sedimentology and stratigraphy. I had a minor in chemistry. Uh, and I, I didn't know how to put those together at the time, put it that way. I, and I had a very helpful advisor, and it's just, uh, you know, the greatest master advisor I could uh, imagine. And, and he was really helpful in introducing me to the field, uh, to the discipline, and all the different ways we can use isotope geochemistry and other chemical markers to uh, reconstruct aspects from the sediments. And what most people are familiar with, uh, you know, when you've got sedimentary rocks, you can look at the features, like a, a here I've got one with ripples on top of it, right? I mean, you can you can look at the sandstone and, and see ripples on here and, and use that to interpret the environment in which it was deposited, right? Uh, we could look at all sorts of things. We could look at the, um, the fossils inside to get a glimpse inside what the environment might have looked like, the ecology, uh, locally, uh, extinctions and, and appearances, radiations, and so forth, uh, and and that's very interesting. Um, I didn't realize just how much you can gather, though, from the chemistry of the rocks, uh, and I focus yeah. specifically on carbonate uh, chemostratigraphy, as it's called, uh, and, okay. and so if you have layers of limestone, and generally, to most people, to most geologists, all limestone looks alike. We love limestone on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I've seen, I've seen, you've done really well with it. Yeah. Uh, if you go to an outcrop of limestone. <laughs> Too badly. <laughs> if, if you go to an outcrop of limestone, which is calcium, carbon, oxygen, right? Uh, yes. It varies a lot. You know, you can just trace it up for a meter or so, and you can see all kinds of subtle changes in the coarseness of the grains, the different types of grains, uh, surfaces that might appear, uh, the thickness, relative thickness of layers and such like that, the fossils that are absent or present. Um, but you can also look at the chemistry, specifically the carbon and oxygen. Uh, carbon in particular, it has two stable isotopes. I, I, most should know about radiocarbon, that's 14C, right? Uh, the stable isotopes are 12 and 13. So most carbon is made up of 12 carbon, that's six protons, six neutrons, and a, a small percentage has an extra neutron. So it's uh, mass 13, right? The ratio of 12 to 13 varies from one environment to the next because right. as carbon's moved around uh, from different parts of the environment, for example, as it goes from the atmosphere to a photosynthetic organism it, where it's processed and turned into sugars or something like that, uh, one of these isotopes is preferred over the other. And depends on the process. In photosynthesis, the lighter isotope is strongly preferred because for that photosynthesis to work, carbon dioxide, the gas, has to move through the membrane, the cellular membrane. And right. the heavier, or sorry, the lighter isotope is has an easier time, more or less, getting through there. And it sounds sure. strange, but uh, it's just a thermodynamic process. Uh, and and yeah. so it gets filtered out slightly. And, and I, I think of it this way, it's the easiest way to explain it. You're hosting a Christmas party, you got a big bowl of red and green M&Ms, which at the beginning of the night is half and half red and green, uh, but you invited the Grinch, and by the end of the night, it's like 80% red. And what happened, yeah. you know? Somebody was pulling, they're not pulling out handfuls at random, they prefer one color over the other. 
So what that does is the handfuls they pull out are mostly green. That leaves the bowl mostly red after a while, Perfect. right? Yeah, so that happens in the oceans. You know, organisms pull out uh, carbon dioxide. They don't know any better, but their cells are actually pulling in more 12 carbon than 13 uh, relative to the concentration in the oceans. Uh, and that, yeah. um, that means that if you measure that ratio in organic material, it's got a very low value. And if you measure it in the oceans, it's slightly higher, right? Yeah. So we can look at that through time. Um, I mean, you measure it in limestone in this layer, and then in this layer, and then this layer. And then for my master's, we did this. And we take a sample every half meter, every meter or so uh, over the course of 400 meters uh, or more and resolve these patterns. And, and for parts of Earth history, it's very flat. Uh, there's a period known as the boring billion in the uh, <laughs> middle Proterozoic, right? So it's about a billion years ago, plus or minus. There's a period where it's just very flat and it doesn't look like there's much going on. Uh, but, people really like to come after the poor Proterozoic people, you know? I know. Let him, let, you know, come on. That, that The Proterozoic is awesome. I mean, it doesn't have like many cool critters, but still. Right. Yeah, but when you, when you get into the Neoproterozoic, um, from a geochemical perspective, it gets really interesting because um, you have events like the Maranoan glaciation, or you know, mm -hmm. the Snowball Earth glaciation, yeah. and that has a huge impact on the carbon cycle, on the, uh, the, the uh, just the, the number of organisms on the planet and, and where they can survive. Uh, and so when you cool down the Earth, you got not that many organisms, especially photosynthetic ones. Uh, and then that ends, that glacial cycle ends, and then we go back to a super carbon dioxide rich environment, uh, and all this sediment is weathered into the oceans, and now you've got a more tropical kind of climate, and uh, there's also a pulse of oxygen, which adds selective pressure, and now organisms don't just thrive, but they diversify, and now you've got yeah. uh, a metazoans showing up using oxygen for the first time in their metabolism. And this has an impact on the carbon cycle because because anytime you've got, you know, organisms pulling carbon dioxide out of the of the oceans, anytime you've got mineral calcite forming, anytime you've got uh, carbonate min uh, minerals on the continents weathering out and pouring off into the ocean, and all this changes that isotopic ratio. So we can right. look at it to interpret how these processes have changed throughout the past. And Sometimes uh, you get very detailed events, and so I studied one one event in particular, uh, where anywhere in the world you go, where you have these index fossils that show you you're in this part of the Cambrian, uh, there's a big spike in a big positive spike in carbon isotope ratios, uh, which is really interesting. I mean, how does that happen if if this is an early flood feature? You know. And because yeah. you have to change the chemistry of the entire ocean, which today holds some 38,000 gigatons of carbon. And you can't, I mean, this is a giant bowl of M&Ms. Uh, yes. it's, 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 it's a lot I mean, of care. Yeah, like I don't care how catastrophic you think the fountains of the deep were. I mean, it doesn't just shift the whole ocean chemistry that fast uh, by that much. And, and so this makes sense uh, looking at long-term geochemical cycles and ecology, uh, it doesn't make sense. I mean, this, this is one of those, you know, the, the small details that is yeah. overlooked by people uh, who might be studying this or coming on to Answers in Genesis. Yeah, the, 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 marine, the marine limestone thing, as, as you know, we, we love limestone on this channel. And something, something that floored me too about limestone is the nature of using that geochemistry that, you're mentioned, that you've mentioned to suss out whether it is indeed marine or freshwater in nature. And I, I find it very uh, alarming that no one really over there has tackled the, the nature of how this maps long periods of time, marine transgressions, oceans growing and shrinking, um, it, 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 new arid climates coming and going and, and things of that nature That's that, that the sea life or that the aquatic life that we see kind of mirrors that, the way that they move inland and, and then regress again. Um, mm -hmm. but, but moreover than that, uh, moreover to that, I, I suppose I should say, the, the explanation for how all that limestone got there, specifically the biogenic limestone, I've yet to see a good explanation for, you know, I mean, it, it can't necessarily, like the ocean couldn't support that much marine life in order to, to actually, you'd have this 
sea of sludge of microorganisms. Yeah, it kind of kill itself yeah. off at that point. Right. Yeah, it, it's unsustainable. Um, mm -hmm. So then I've also heard, you know, that maybe that well, the fountains of the Great Deep, as as you mentioned, maybe limestone was sequestered in these great underground chambers, um, mm -hmm. um, either in its biogenic form of of life or in some other way as as some kind of biogenic looking limestone. But that pressure, the pressure that you would have to have for these underwater oceans, which are then expelled everywhere, creates new geochemical problems. Um, right. So I, I don't know. I've yet to see a good explanation for limestone, which is, you know, hence the bite-sized bust. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, there, I, there isn't. Um, they tried. But I mean, it, it requires you to sustain a high level of ignorance. And I, I don't mean that as an insult. I mean, just you have to ignore a lot of field data. And no. what they won't do, what they should do, is simple. Like if you think X is the source of the carbon in, in your scenario, like just make a hypothesis about the chemical yeah. tracers, whether isotopic or trace elements or, or something else that should appear and you know be in the signal. I mean, that's, that's what we do in uh, paleoecological reconstructions and such. Like we right. make hypotheses about how the carbon cycle might have changed. And if it changed in this fashion, what should that do to carbon isotopes? What should it do to nitrogen isotopes? What should it do to manganese concentrations? In the, what about sulfur, right? Uh, and, and all of those are used together um, to write this story, right? And yeah, it's, it's a feasible model that has mechanisms within it that can then be tested, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that was uh, really enlightening for me. And that was, actually something of a motivation too for writing articles uh just to introduce people to aspects that they probably didn't hear much about uh right. and that's okay it's no fault of their own like there's so many disciplines i could only scratch the surface that and i'm very ignorant of but i wouldn't you know i wouldn't know that at the same time i don't go out and give speeches about those disciplines and try to convince people that the uh, that that the conventional theory is just wrong um so so that's yeah that's how i think about it anyways <laughs> no no i mean i i can't i cannot agree more you know it's i think that sums it up quite nicely this it's it's this goal of and as we spoke about earlier in you know in our, our kind of meeting prior to, to this stream, it's about making it accessible to people. It's about giving folks who may not have a background in something the option to get into it. A, a gateway, if you will, a gateway science. <laughs> right. um, which, which, you know, for everyone who's curious, Age of Rocks, uh, Jonathan's website, you can find that link in the description and you should absolutely check it out. It's got some incredible articles that are just very problematic if you want to take the the 6,000 year uh, and, and global flood approach. But, you know, it's interesting to me, and again, we spoke about this earlier, we can look to the distant past, and, and as you did with the Cambrian, I'm looking at uh, different geochemical signals and things of that nature to say, okay, well, it's very clear that what we've got is a sort of cyclic environment that's changing um, and organisms that are of course changing in tandem, oceanic chemistry, atmospheric carbon, all of these things acting and reacting with one another over long periods of time, but would not be possible during a single six month time period um, for energy reasons, let alone ecological reasons. But we don't even have to go that far back, right? Mm -hmm. We can look at ourselves, okay, well, how how is it that the environment has been changing? Um, and you do that a lot with caves, no? So, yeah, I went from looking at really thick, you know, hundreds of meters thick sequences of limestone to looking at small sequences of limestone. I mean, it's the same principle, <laughs> looking at uh, chemical variations in uh, layered limestone, but uh, instead of marine sequences, uh, more recent features, we can look at cave formations. Um, right. And I, I'll, I'll assume that uh, people know the general process by which caves form and then by which speleothems grow. But I, I mean, I have an example here, you can see, we've got a piece of a stalactite which would grow from the ceiling and this is like a soda straw stalactite. So a drip would come through the bottom and it will grow uh, little by little, these tend to grow relatively fast. Uh, right. And then the bottom, the stalactite growing from the 
ground up, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and if you think about the process and the way it grows, you've got a, a drip on the top of it that uh, flows over the sides and that small film of water will evaporate where it dissolves CO2. And as it does, it changes the pH of that water and it deposits its calcite, its bicarbonate and right, yeah. calcite uh, layer by layer. So if we take this and flip it around, um, you can see it's got some stratigraphy to it, right? It's not That's the same the as the, um, this is not the polished surface, this is the archive half, so I apologize, it's not as clear. But you can see right here where the color changes makes this um, line. So you could see what the um, stalagmite looked at when it was this old, and then the layers grew up and up towards so what, the So what is, what is causing the change in color, The this banding that we see? So is it changes in color could be, um, they could be related to surface processes, like the amount of rain, uh, that's coming through or say how organic rich it is if you've got uh, strong producing soils or arid times uh, but it, it could just be simple changes in the crystallography uh, the, the crystal structure of the calcite uh, sometimes it will shift between aragonite and calcite depending on the, the cave environment uh, often it could be other trace elements um, but often it seems it, it's not always related to environmental processes. Um, it could even be the cave climate inside, like a temperature of the cave and concentration of carbon dioxide. Caves tend to breathe yes. as well. So they will um, breathe in air from the outside, uh, usually in winter. I mean, when the surface, when the outside air temperature is colder than the cave, then it's dense enough to flow down into the cave. And in the summer, it stagnates and carbon dioxide and other gases will build up inside the cave. Okay. Uh, and so, but it, so it, part of the year it can exhale, inhale, and, and so forth. But the extent to which you can do that will depend on the ambient environment. It may depend on the formation of the cave, like if new passages open up and connect to the surface, that changes the air that flows through. So all kinds of um, factors that go into it. And that makes looking at cave formations potentially complicated, um, but it's it's fairly easy to find scenarios where, where they could be uh, good natural records of ancient processes. And so we've got this, um, right. as an example, um, slug mic growing up. And this is, I think this one is a hiatus uh, here. I mean, there's a, just a small period where it stopped growing briefly about four or 5,000 years ago, and then it resumed growth after a short period. Uh, right. And cool. when you can pick these out, you can polish them down, look at them under a microscope and see in more detail. Uh, I showed you an image earlier about, uh, we can use a confocal microscope, which uh, illuminates elements, especially uh, like phosphorus and, and stuff that might show up in organics, right? So you can see layers, bright layers, contrast with the dark layers as you might in, I don't know, like a tree ring, right? Yeah. Like a winter and summer growth. Uh, but it tend, depends on the cave environment. I mean, some are highly seasonal, like monsoon cave systems. You get all this rain in the summertime and then nothing the rest of the year. Uh, others are more constant. Um, you get Mediterranean caves, right? So it's wet in the winter and dry in the summer, uh, things like that. And, and so everyone is different, but the principle is the same. So I, I've heard this too, as, as kind of a, a side note, I've heard this too, that it can be done uh, with VAR formations and pollen grains. So measuring how much pollen you can find in, in given VARs, particularly if they form like biannually, you get pollen, no pollen, pollen, no pollen. And you can, you can use that to count the years, um, which of course, you know, from, from a perspective of how has seasonality um, been changing based off of like how how the how the precession of the earth, the tilt, um, the cycles like orbital cycles and things like that? Um, how do our seasons from seasonality to not very seasonal at all, and how does that Im impact the wildlife? But also begs the question: How on earth can you get these 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 cave formations and these pollen grain? Uh, like cycles during a single year long flood. Um, and, and I think that what the area that you're studying is, is particularly interesting, kind of the, the recent past, because this is supposedly over the past like one to 2000 years rather than um, like the six month period of the flood, um, which, is, which is strange to me, because if it's not being deposited 
during a catastrophic condition, then, then you, you have to abide by regular old natural processes occurring as they should, which mm -hmm. creates some interesting problems, I, I would wager. Yeah, so in the context of young earth creationism and, and flood geology, uh, this is a problem for them, or at least it's an open question for them, uh, where they want to put the boundary between those catastrophic processes uh, forming this part of the geologic column and stuff that looks close to modern processes forming the top part of the geologic yeah. column. And yeah. different different ones will cut off at various levels. Some at will say anything below the Cenozoic is flood geology uh, and anything above the Cenozoic is post-flood, something like that. Uh, right. it, it's not exactly arbitrary, but it's uh, pretty close because they don't have a good way to test it. Um, but we can say, at, at the very least, like if you're nice. looking at surface lakes, surface lakes and cave systems, these have to be post-flood features, right? I mean, and geologically speaking, these are young features. Uh, the oldest lakes are a few million years old, but even that's, I mean, in the context of the whole Earth history, that's not very old, right? Um, yeah. But most lakes are in the realm of a few thousand to a few tens of thousands of years old. And uh, a lot of cave systems are, you know, fewer than a, a million years old. Uh, or at least their formations, so the stalagmites and such, if you see them in caves, generally they're not older than half a million years. And if they're actively growing, probably yeah. they're within the last few thousand years. So uh, these are young formations, regardless of what you think about what young means. Um, yes, yeah. right. It, right. It, at least, okay, we can agree on this much with a young earth creationist that these are post-flood features in their worldview. Sure. Um, you can't imagine that uh, caves were, you know, the limestone was actually solidifying during the flood and then it was dissolving out by surface water coming through. I mean, it, it just doesn't work. <laughs> uh, yeah. and the same with a lake, you know, lakes don't form. So if they find, I mean, if you found a barbed lake system, um, they generally would suggest that's, that's just something that formed since the flood. And if you can count more than you know, more than four and a half thousand varves uh, going back, meaning four and a half thousand years, then right. there must be some process by which multiple varves formed in a single year, right? Same with tree rings. So they'll suggest if, if you yeah. find that many tree rings or this many layers uh, in banded ice, say in Greenland, uh, and those layers in Greenland and, and especially in Antarctica sometimes can be visible back to 20,000, give or take. Not always that far back, yeah. but uh, definitely beyond four and a half thousand. Uh, yeah. They're visibly sure. banded. Yeah. Uh, we don't stop with visibly banded. I mean, they're, you can, they're also geochemically banded. Um, if you could look at a number of other proxies. But the fact is, um, so they have to find a way to deal with these young formations that must have formed after the flood, but are obviously older than four and a half thousand years. Or, or span more than so four do and a half you know, yeah yeah do you know of any way by which that can occur um is is there a way to accelerate the formation of, of banded ice or um i know the tree ring one is is quite difficult for them because the, typically when trees are growing they don't tend to double up on rings in fact they're more frequently seen skipping rings <laughs> because right. it's easier to just serve the metabolic energy of, of the tree and not grow a ring that year than it is to say, wow, look at all this energy. Let's grow 600 rings. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, so, yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, let's start with ice. Um, in terms of annual, the, the seasonal banding in ice, uh, hypothetically, yes, you could have events if they're strong enough that might form what appears to be a band that's not an actual annual band or something like that. So uh, that could happen. Uh, and I'd, I'd say it probably does happen now and then, uh, but it's not like we just look at the ice, we count the bands and we say, that's it. We're going to assume they're all representing one year and let's go on <laughs> our way. Uh, I mean, ice I, cores I, are I, I, from all different parts of Greenland. For, as I'll just Let's stick with Greenland for the moment. Uh, you got like six or seven locations throughout Greenland where you get these deep, long cores taken. Uh, and then they count the bands in each and document where are the bands visible. Okay, we think there's a band between here and here. If that is the, an actual seasonal band, it should also have fluctuations in oxygen, hydrogen isotopes. It should have fluctuations in, uh, say, salt contents. Right. 
uh, and other things that will change between winter circulation and summer circulation, right? Uh, because winter weather patterns are different than summer, the, uh, the, the seasonality of precipitation uh, is very clear, and um, more importantly, the temperature, whether it's accumulating ice, frozen, or melting, and so they're always melt accumulation layers, as they're called, uh, yeah. in, in there as well. So it's not, they're not just simply looking and like it's, it goes from light to dark, light to dark, and we're gonna assume that's an annual band. There's a, there are a lot of proxies that go into identifying that. But once you have it in one ice core, then you take it and compare it to the other part of Greenland and match them up. And then the other part and match it up. Uh, and to be fair, uh, you'll never get this simple 100% match every layer to every layer. So we do know that there are cases where you, you might have a missing band or one that's ambiguous or accidentally double counted or something like that, but it is quite rare. And based on comparing all those cores to each other, uh, the uncertainty uh, depends on how far back you go. So if you go back to say 8,000 years ago, the uncertainty in the Greenland ice core chronology is assumed to be about plus or minus 40 or 50 years. Sure, sure. So if, yeah. if we say this, this band uh, is, 8,000 years old, what they mean is 8,000 plus or minus 40 years, right? It might be 8,033 years old, right. but it's definitely not 2,000 years old. Uh, so there's a, that, that uncertainty window is quite small, nonetheless. So, so this, oh, you're blowing my mind. You're telling me there's corroborative methods? <laughs> <laughs> well, not just there. I mean, that's that's within uh, glacial ice, right? Right, sure. Uh, those, those glacial records, uh, the, the longest in Antarctica, go back at least eight hundred thousand years, and you know we're on the edge of extending that back further, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, I mean, it, it just doesn't it doesn't just stop there. So within, say, the Greenland ice core, we can look at certain proxies like oxygen and hydrogen isotopes that tell us. Uh, about precipitation, for example, where did the moisture come from? Uh, how warm or cold was it, generally speaking? Uh, usually use nitrogen isotopes to get an annual average temperature proxy. Right, right. Uh, can also get out gas bubbles, so we know concentrations of carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases. Uh, can look at salt content, as I mentioned before, uh, the calcium and sodium salt content uh, tends to fluctuate depending on whether the predominant winds are coming from Eurasia or the North Atlantic. So uh, they will blow dust in from this part of the world versus this part. And that's how, yeah. Yeah. Right now. so we can, we can, we have a measure for generally how, uh, you know, about all aspects of the climate uh, from the Greenland ice core, but we can use that and test that hypothesis. I mean, there are, there are several points at, with the, at which the Greenland ice core shows these very significant anomalies, you know, periods that look like uh, the climate got rapidly quite cold. You know, within sure. 40 or 50 years, the temperature dropped by one or two degrees. And then it came back up. And so we can look at that event and say, well, if that happened in Greenland, shouldn't have happened, I don't know, in Europe, Scandinavia. Uh, and, and then you can that's, check it. It produces a testable hypothesis, right? So you go over Absolutely. to Scandinavia and you think, well, okay, we don't have any stable ice cores, but we do have lots of lakes and they have pollen accumulated in the layers and we can date those not you not typically by varves uh some of them you can sure but uh even if not we can use radiocarbon to date those layers so let's you know look at lakes in scandinavia go back to a layer that's about eight thousand years and and find this cold anomaly that we see in the greenland ice core and is there evidence for it there and and yeah there are lakes all over europe and scandinavia that uh, show uh, a change in their pollen composition toward colder adapted species where the warm, you know, the, the species that are most sensitive to frost damage that need a stronger summer temperature to grow, uh, these tend to disappear slightly in that interval and then they reappear afterward. Right. And, and so, but those lakes are dated by the radiocarbon method, which has nothing to do with counting ice layers, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, and so if those ice layers were miscounted, I mean, if we were just wrong and those were not annual bands going back tens of thousands of years, uh, then those ages shouldn't match up at all. We, we, we've got a, a completely independent method by which to double check ourselves here, which is right. absolutely impeccable. Yeah. And I, I can show you, well, 
So I, I mentioned lakes and such. We, I mean, we and we talked a bit about cave records. So when we're looking at the um, speleothems here, uh, you can see layer by layer visibly how they go up. But usually, what happens? We'll drill a little bit of powder uh, every millimeter, every half a millimeter, sometimes every tenth of a millimeter or less. Uh, it depends. We can get it to be a very high resolution. And we'll measure that powder again for its carbon and oxygen isotopes. Uh, we can also measure trace elements uh, like magnesium, strontium, calcium, uh, barium, uh, phosphorus, uranium, and so forth, uh, and see how those vary through time. Oxygen isotopes are the, probably the most common proxy used because they directly reflect the chemistry of the precipitation that's falling over the cave, right? So the oxygen isotope ratio in the uh, cave system, I mean, all that water infiltrates down, uh, and that records the ratio that's in the precipitation, the rain or snow that's right. falling. And that ratio is generally controlled by uh, how continental the site is, the temperature along the storm path, and where that moisture is coming from. So if you have a shift over time, <laughs> give a shift over time from a, a you know, a, a cave site that gets most of its rain from the subtropical North Atlantic. And over a long period of time, it gets colder. And so the moisture source shifts to the north and the temperature over land drops, then that oxygen isotope ratio will also drop because of the physical processes that control um, the, the ratio at the cave site, right? I, I, I had not even considered the idea too that, that you can you're essentially like reconstructing these ancient storm systems by by looking at the the chemistry of these of these caves that's so cool and it, it creates you know I, I don't know the, the science behind it is awesome and the relating it to the to the younger creationism thing this creates dozens of of different ways by which to essentially falsify your hypothesis in a in a given situation and, and right. I, that's amazing that there are so many different ways to double well, yeah, check this, yourself. This could fail at every step, which makes it so much fun. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. but again, it's, it offers, too, another independent dating method. I and mean, we can count ice bands. That's one way of looking. We can count varves in certain lake systems. We can count tree rings back a while. Uh, we can use radiocarbon dating to, to look at, like, organic-rich layers of lake sediment. Uh, and in this case, we use uranium and thorium. Uh, the reason being that it's fresh water flowing into the cave, fresh water that's generally well oxygenated. And in oxygenated water, uh, thorium is not soluble, but uranium is. Okay. So trace amounts of uranium will flow down into uh, in, into the cave system, and the thorium mm -hmm. tends to be excluded. Right? right. And uranium and thorium both have multiple isotopes, which are radioactive. Each has their own half-life. Yep. And it creates a complicated system. It's, it's definitely more complicated than you know, if any intro video that you watch on radiometric dating, it's the same concept, but it's a, you know, a intro to radiometric dating will show you like, we've got a bird bath and, and the top has all the water and the bottom has none. And over time it flows out of the top into the bottom. And it's kind of like that, except you also poke holes in the bottom birth bath and then you, <laughs> and they're all flowing in and out at different rates. So the math is more complicated, but um, actually creates a more robust system. I, 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 check all the assumptions that you make. Yeah. Uh, I know that they love that word assumption. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I think that it's, it's awesome too, because you, you essentially know that by, by jumping through so many different hoops by which to double, triple check to make sure that you're um, accounting for all of these factors that can, that can alter um, the state of the system that you're looking at, you know that when you get your answer that it, this is a robust conclusion um it, it, even if it's if it's like this is this is what it looks like our day well i can i can show if you like yeah please okay we every, so, everyone is a uh, a good uh, visual learner here <laughs> well i'll give an example um the younger dryas events which uh, you know feel free to wikipedia that it's got a decent explanation i mean the younger dryas event was a famous cold event it's what marks the the um the boundary between the Holocene and, and the previous time, right? So that's uh, the the last ice age peaked around 21,000 years ago. It got gradually warmer, warmer, warmer. And around 12 and a half thousand years ago, it suddenly got very cold. 
Um, this is associated with a number of megafaunal extinctions, uh, especially yeah. in the North North America. Uh, there's a lot to learn about it. Um, but just an example, it shows up very clearly in the Greenland ice course as a sudden drop in oxygen isotope radio, sudden, sudden drop in temperature. Um, but we can look at it in cave records, why not? I mean, it should show up there too. If, if that climate system is interrupted, then shouldn't that affect the climate in Western Europe, right? Or even in the tropics. And, and that's quite exactly what we find. So if I do this. Oh God, hopefully I don't have to give you permission here. Hopefully it'll just let you share. Tell me oh, if you can. It is, yes, it is. Super. Okay, so so here's one plot showing in, in high resolution. At the bottom, you can see the age scale. So 11,000 years ago, going back to 13 and a half thousand years ago. This is the oxygen plot from the Greenland ice core. And I see the ups and downs. And this is a that same interval in a cave record from Spain. <laughs> That's so cool. And these are dated independently. Again, the you, you can see this. A dot with the air bar, that's the average uncertainty I mentioned for the ice core that's based on comparing different cores to each other uh, from which we interpret a uh, uncertainty. Like we, we think that the age is plus or minus here. Uh, the uncertainty in the, the cave date, those uranium thorium dates is here. So it's much smaller, uh, more precise. <laughs> what we found is despite this difference in uncertainty, we found that the Greenland ice core chronology is actually more precise than they thought it was. Uh, because it's it's like it, these match up like within 10 or 20 years of each other, which is amazing. That that is absolutely stunning. That's so cool. As you know, that's it's interesting too. I, there, I believe there was a paper that came out this week. Um, for, for quite some time, and you'll see this a lot in, in anthropology and a lot of books that cover um, recent mass extinction events, but a recent paper came out that, that actually showed that megafauna extinctions, as you were just saying, track much more concisely, not with the migration of humans, but with climatic change, which is something that I think seemed almost a little bit intuitive, like that this idea that, oh, wow, humans are, humans are killing off all of the megafauna. It's like, well... Some probably, <laughs> but certainly not. Certainly not all. The, the the climate can do that on its own. Yeah, I mean, this this question is has always been evolving. Uh, it gained a lot of traction in the the mid twentieth century, and especially with the introduction of these overhill overkill hypotheses, um, we found certain hunting technologies that appeared at the same time. I mean, arrowhead and spearhead technologies that appeared at the same time as things like mammoth. And mastodons went extinct or started going extinct and didn't seem reasonable just as a coincidence at least they hypothesized that well as humans spread and they hunted more of these animals that so they disappeared uh and and it's not like that didn't have an impact um but that that's something that's very difficult to test it's been a little bit easier in more recent years as we gather more and more information especially more detailed information on climatic swings and how it varied regionally uh, I mean, in climate, we have, yeah, we can study climate globally, average temperature, average rainfall, average drought, whatever it may be, uh, or we can look specifically at a region. Those don't always go with right. each other. People make that a mistake a lot. They'll show a plot of the Greenland ice core and they say, look, this is what earth temperature did over, and it's not earth temperature, it's Greenland temperature, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, yeah. and, and so, you know, we can use that as a proxy, but now, you know, in recent decades, we've got more and more detailed pro more detailed reconstructions for uh, the Americas, for Siberia, for other places, Australia, where you have these um, mass extinction events uh, in megafauna, that is. And it's become more clear that the role of humans and the role of climate were not the same across the globe. Uh, in each continent, they had various um, contribution. So in, in the Americas, humans played a slightly larger role than they did in Eurasia. Mm. But a much smaller role than it did in or humans played a much larger role in Australia, for example. Yeah, and it 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 kind of it almost checks out too because the the rate at which humans are kind of being introduced into these locations, um, it's it's no surprise that Africa contains some of the the last true megafauna that that we see today in the sense that we get these grand creatures 
uh, moving across the uh, across the landscape because humans humans evolved there. We've been there for quite some time, um, yeah. and the humans that are, the neighbors and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then we'll, we'll and you know you think of Africa or uh, Africa, you think of Australia, and humans just show up, and everything's like, what are these weird bipeds? How do we respond to them? I guess we'll die. You know, it's like yeah, that's all that they can. That's all that they can really do. Um, yeah. It's, um... It's just like a living commercial for a steakhouse or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it really is. Yeah, you you picture you know if you picture like these ancient in like uh, New Zealand these ancient moa and the moa are just right. you know, minding their own business. Like these aren't even scary animals too. They're just big and they're gonna feed yeah. us for a long time. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then golly, and all the um all the casualties of us eating up all of the good food comes from like house eagles disappearing and all these predators are like. Where did these small things come from? Why are they eating all my stuff? Um, mm -hmm. But it's yeah, it's 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 quite funny. I wanted to ask you too, and we we talked a little bit about this earlier, but we didn't dig into it quite as much. And and I I'm just of sheer curiosity. The formation of glaciers um, can that occur quickly? No. Okay. <laughs> okay cool. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, if you I mean if you have a lot of snow accumulation and the glaciers over time glacial mass represents the balance i mean no matter where glaciers form there's always going to be a warm and cold season uh and typically that's you know accumulation season and melting season right and if the accumulation is higher than melt then it's going to accumulate you know you have net accumulation if it's melting right. more in the summer than it is accumulating in the winter then it's going to go away uh how rapidly can that happen i mean there, yeah there's a limit to how much moisture the atmosphere holds especially at higher latitudes in colder regions and it yeah the the those systems are driven by the heat imbalance i mean earth i mean think of the earth <laughs> them, uh, i mean at the equator that's that's where most of the energy is coming in that means at the poles uh, there's very little energy coming in so you have a heat in a planetary heat imbalance from equator to pole. And the natural force is, is for that heat to move from here to here. And, right. and that different that imbalance is what drives uh, those main weather systems, right? So uh, there's, there's a physical limit to which you can strengthen those overall or weaken them or, or what may be the case. And there's also a physical limit to how fast uh, water evaporates into the atmosphere, how much water vapor that can hold and uh, how much can actually condense out and, and form snow. And yeah, ba based on that, then no, I, I, I'm, before anyone wants to comment, I mean, I am familiar with uh, like Ord and others and Vardam and, and such who have, have tried to propose these superstorm hypercanes and, yes. and other ways that make you think that, that uh, it's possible to just to dump tons and tons of snow on there. But a couple of things to keep in mind, I mean, one is this has to occur over a really long period of time consistently, like that has to be the stable climate. And uh, this is such an extreme thing that it's not even, it's not observed within human observation. It's never been observed within human documentation, this sort of process. So yeah. uh, this is, is sort of a sci-fi explanation that would leave a mark. I mean, it, it would leave a mark. And there are ways again to test that. I mean, if if we're if I'm wrong, and yeah, actually, some of these glaciers did accumulate much more rapidly than we think, then go ahead and test it. I mean, especially isotopically, those are the main tracers that we use uh, to look at the conditions of temperature at the moisture source, relative humidity at the moisture source, average temperature along the storm path, rates of accumulation, rates of melt, and so forth. Like, I you have these proxies available, like just use those. Yeah, I, I would yeah. even argue too that the, I would argue too that since you know climate change is on the forefront of not enough people's mind, but certainly a lot of minds in in the scientific community, and um, the, the you know we're constantly looking at these isotopic ratios and of of ice at our poles. You sure would think that something like that would have stuck out like a sore thumb by now. Um, you yeah, know the, yeah. the hypothesis you're talking about. Why don't they just test it? I mean, it almost seems like we've inadvertently already tested it, and and such a signature, to our knowledge, does not exist. Yeah. no, that's that's absolutely true. Um, and when glaciology began, like as a curiosity, it wasn't an official discipline. 
there was no agenda there to yeah to, to, to confirm any sort of preconceived bias like in fact uh, many of these people are coming into you know evidence of glaciers still thinking in the context of global catastrophes and they had no incentive there to like portray these as super long slow processes or whatever uh, right. but even yeah like with, with what we have the tools we have available to analyze this uh, the only reason they wouldn't test this is they already know the answer because you're right it already has been tested even though that wasn't like the way it was phrased in the paper um, those data you know, all, all those data from the last 50 years of, of you know studying ice cores and such they absolutely are inconsistent with the idea that these glaciers accumulated rapidly you know from superstorms to any other process uh, and they're all very much uh, corroborated by all other lines of evidence that we have spanning the quaternary which is the last the quaternary by the way is the last 2.6 million years uh, of earth history and that's that's divided into the holocene pleistocene the holocene begins about 11,650 years ago and everything before that is uh the pleistocene what we kind of call the the ice ages but um yeah. as we as you know ice ages are uh, they they occur intermittently you know cyclically every 80 to 120,000 years we get large ice ages and every 40,000 years or so we get um uh, you know still swings in temperature and ice glacial growth and, and contraction so those big ice ages though like we know of the last one and i know young earthers have looked a lot at the evidence of that ice age which uh, peaked around twenty-one thousand years ago and took about ten thousand years for that all to you know come to an end you melt away to the point where we have our modern looking sure. climate um but there's also a, a ice age just as large previous to that, right, that uh, peaked about 140,000 years ago. <laughs> and then before that, another one, before mm -hmm. that, another one, before mm -hmm. that, another one. So even if we could, let's, let's say that we could find a way physically uh, that the, uh, let me use this again, to explain how this ice sheet that covered not just Greenland, but the entirety of Canada up here, right? Ooh. So the entirety of Canada coming all the way down to the Midwest in the US, uh, there's one ice sheet and then there's the other ice sheet here covering scan most of Scandinavia, parts of Central Europe, and all of Northwestern Russia. Right, And that was just the last ice sheet. Let's say we can explain how that one accumulated rapidly. Well, what about the one before that that was just as large, almost yeah. as large in North America, and actually almost twice as large in Eurasia? And what about the one before that and the one before that? Because you, it's, if you go to Russia as, as an example, digging back through the sediments, you you know you have the modern Holocene interglacial. Before that, you have these uh, the glacial sediments with very different, you know, tundra-like um, ecologies in in the pollen, and then it goes back to a warm interval, and then it goes back to this long glacial period, and then a warm interval, uh, and then we can find evidence of where those glacials those gla glaciers terminated, right? Because when they terminate, they tend to dump all of their cobbles and boulders and silt and everything that they picked up along the way. They dump it all at the end, you know, at, at the moraine sites. Uh, and you can find, you know, the evidence of moraines, of, of those ice sheets terminating way down. So not just the last one, but several before that. Uh, evidence of proglacial sediments. So that means like near the glacier, when it's melting, you get very uh, fast flowing streams that are sediment choked that form very unique lakes. Uh, you know, not like typical freshwater lakes, but these are like choked in carbonate and silt and clays and all sorts of things. They tend right. to form right. as well. So a very distinct uh, proglacial environmental features uh i mean we can track these evidence of this for at least the last five or six major ice ages and that's just the last five or six um so i mean if you want to squeeze the ice age into this younger timeline it's not just finding a way to explain ice sheets that were big enough to raise the sea level by more than 120 meters right 120 meters of sea level from these ice sheets. That's just what's melted. That doesn't include the rest of the ice sheets that haven't melted yet. 
Um, you want to say that that formed rapidly within a few hundred years, not just that one, but the one before it, which was just as large, and one before that, which was just as large, and so forth. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So not only can you right. test it just through, through the processes, the way that we study the water cycle and, and the tracers that we use to uh, as physical proxies, but God, just just look at the geological record, which again is very detailed. Uh, yeah, I, I listen. Big big glaciology is 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 what's keeping down the <laughs> the, the mm. creationists on this one. But yeah, I that's that's a great point though. I I had not even considered these these pre these ice ages previous just to just the most recent one because if if memory serves, the most um, typically held position is that Mesozoic and prior is going to be your your flood your flood geology which means you're right you have so many ice ages to cram into this this single this this post flood quote unquote world um and and golly that's difficult um to, to cram into the time frame yes but I, just just the resources that would be required to leave all of those signatures i it, that blows my mind i, I hadn't even <laughs> i hadn't even thought about that I can, um, yeah, I can show you here what that looks like, at least for the Quaternary. Yeah. Um, also, I've been saying Quaternary this entire time. It's Thank okay. You it's, 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 it's okay to be wrong sometimes. No, I'm just kidding. If you can <laughs> say it both ways. It's, <laughs> I don't know, aluminum, aluminium, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and people still say Quaternary. And, uh, that, that's yeah, fine. Anyways, so, I mean, here's the time scale. This is uh, from the marine record. So I mean, I showed you some some of these records from ice sheets and and uh, a couple speleothems, but this one's from the this is the the composite for all the deep ocean cores around the world, and this is oxygen isotope ratio on the side. And basically, yeah. up means warmer, less okay. glacial ice, and down means colder with lots of glacial ice. Okay. Right. <laughs> so up, this is where we are today. And this is 21,000 years ago here. And this is up, down, up, down, up, right? So this is about 125,000 years ago. This is about 140,000 years ago. So you see this is a pattern, right? Like this this last 20,000 years looks just like right. it did here, right? And there's another one, another one, another one, another one. And let's go back to the beginning of the Quaternary, which is right here, 2.6 million years ago. Uh, and I mean, this goes back. To yeah, that's, million years that's, in their composite. I mean, it, the, there are ocean sediments older than that, but it gets harder and harder to recover layers from enough cores as you go farther and farther back because that's that's just how geology works. The farther you go back, the the worse the coverage is. I, uh, I have no idea that the cycles were that quick. That's that is that is very hard to cope with. Yeah, so something happens here about a million years ago. Um, previous to that, the dominant cycle is every 40,000 years. And that right. goes with the what's called the obliquity cycle. Okay. After about a million years ago, it switches. And so every two to three obliquity cycles, which means every 80,000 or every 120,000 years, you get uh, a large ice age. And in between there, you'll get a, a smaller cycle, right? So it goes up right. and a little dip and then up. And then a little dip up. Uh, and, and so that's the general pattern in the last million years. And, and what controls that generally is there's a threshold for how much glacial ice you have across the globe. So uh, there's a cooling trend from 5 million years ago to today. Overall cooling. I mean, obviously, it just goes up and down. But the general trend is one of cooling and more glacial growth. So as the ice sheets got larger and larger, um, these longer, more extreme ice ages were uh, easier to sustain right and they would also crash you know it's kind of a bigger you are harder you fall concept right, so right, right, right. really big and then they would crash and go the total opposite way and then get really big and crash oh that's so cool i'm, I'm noticing too you you've got like a it's you've got like a step upward and then sort of a, a steep plunge as we move back in time mm -hmm. pretty consistently right so this for example is a big transition from six to five, this is marine isotope stage six, marine isotope stage five. Uh, between 130, 128,000 years is when this takes place. It's a very rapid warming. That's what that represents. 
Okay. So very rapid collapse of that um, that ice age, and then a slow burn back into the deep freeze. Uh, I know that makes total sense, right? <laughs> and then um, yeah. and then yeah. rapid collapse around twenty one thousand, and so it takes about ten thousand years to warm up to this period, and then the Holocene is what we've experienced since then, right? Uh, but this, I mean, this comes from dozens or hundreds of ice cores around the world, uh, all measured, all with their own age models, and all stacked together through statistical method, which is described in this paper from 2004. Right. Oh my gosh. Yeah, from 2004 too. So, so this is this comes falls under my concern of some people should know better, right? Because it's like this, this yeah. data is available for quite some time. Right. It it has been around for a long time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, I mean that that was their their composite, and that was, was very useful. And which means, as you can imagine, in the last 17, 16 years, a lot has been done since then. More cores recovered, age oh model proof, whatever. And yeah. and so we didn't just stop there. <laughs> like so, paleoceanography moved on. So and and this, I had emailed you about this, and of course, I'm, I don't want to dwell on it because I know it's not your area. But I I had mentioned this. I mentioned this on this channel as well. But the, but the same thing is true for the the concepts that underlie finding fossil fuels, right? Like it's it's this concept that the data for using basin modeling to and radiometric dating to to find excellent deposits of um, oil or gas or whatever that tech's been around for quite some time, and it's only been getting better through the years as mm -hmm. we continue to um, kind of fine tune our ability to to detect what layers indicate what conditions right are, are ideal for formation and so it's it's interesting to me that this is that this is reflected in other areas as well because so frequently when you see kind of uh a, a, attempts to buck the convention here they'll they'll pull a paper from like 1980s and they'll be like ha see <laughs> look at look at the measurements that they've got from this paper from 1980 and you're like yeah. dude <laughs> you got anything a little bit more recent um, but but you're right. In the same in the same way, we're we're pulling more cores, more and more cores, in order to get a handle yeah. on the I imminent. Will, I'm glad you brought that up. Just as a general rule, um, like having a paper that's old, it, it, it doesn't mean it's bad because it's sure. old, yes. and, okay. and or that it's out of date. The best way to look at that, which everyone has access to, go to scholar.google.com, find that paper, and click on the little button that says "cited by." Yep. First, look at the number. Right. If there's a paper from 1980 and it says cited by four, <laughs> four people have cited that paper, which means generally speaking, researchers in that discipline didn't think it was very important. Right. 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 But it says cited by 2000. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. paper had a big impact on the way that we think, and we've interacted with it. Now that might be we've interacted with it because, like the one I just showed you, a lot of citations on that paper because it's very useful. Mm -hmm. um, and it continues to be useful, and it continues to be corroborated, and, and so forth. Uh, and, and it gets citations because of that. Other papers may get a lot of citations because they, uh, I don't know, formed a paradigm that turned out to be quite wrong. Right. That's OK, too. But that's why you go to that cited by, click on that yep. link, say, well, these 100 or so papers that have cited it since, are they citing it because they think, yeah, this is still valid? Or are they citing it because? They're they dunking on it. Not valid, right? And you can you can see that um, just browsing through the titles, browsing through the abstracts. And that may take a lot of work, or, or you can get it in a quick glance. But yeah. that's a research tool that anybody can use in any field for any paper. And when some if somebody links you a paper from 1954, um, there are still plenty of papers from the 1950s that we cite all the time, and they're quite valid, right? Uh, I, I'm writing my thesis right now, and I have um, I, I'm citing some of Darwin's original work in the paper because it's it involves natural selection, and so I'm like, hey, this is Darwin, you know, 18, 1870s, and it'll be like, oh, okay, you know, very, very cool. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, and I don't think I say that. Um, I don't think I say that enough. It's, it's certainly context dependent. The, the, the reason why I tend to dunk on a lot of the, the 1980s papers is simply because they tend to be parodings of like Morris or Gish or something like that. Um, yeah. No, I've seen that too. And, and they're typically examples, like I said, uh, where they've been cited by a half dozen people since 1980. Right. And, Good. 
and those half dozen, they cited it in a context that has nothing to do with the reason that person is sharing the paper with you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I had my experiences too, especially there's a, a article written by Andrew Snelling and Steve Austin on salt accumulation in the oceans. And they cited a bunch of papers. A lot of them were from the seventies and eighties, not because there was anything like, right. because that's when geochemists went around and, and we tried to like, they, we, they tried to resolve, um, you know, the, the various reservoirs of almost every element throughout the earth. And they completed that work in the seventies and eighties and there was not really reason to update it. So those papers are there for that reason. But um, I mean, they wrote this paper right. where they're arguing that the, the oceans are getting saltier, they're accumulating salt. And if we assume that they started out fresh even, uh, then in, they can't be more than 60 something million years old. Uh, and therefore we've got a problem in our uniform, uniform and uniformitarian uh, worldviews here. So, <laughs> but I, I remember going back and I, I found those references in the library and I was like, well, let's look at the flux that he used in this calculation, the sediment flux right. that he cites here. And I found it, found the paragraph where it was and, and there it was like, uh, this sediment flux is valid after 1940s because of fertilizers used in agriculture. It's not valid before 1940. Oh <laughs> And and uh, you know, little things like that. So they'll cite this paper where you can only find it by going to a university library and, and finding it in print. Hunting it down, right? Yeah, hunting um, it down in the stacks, old school, um, which I, I I did. I was happy to do it. That's fine. I, I I like that kind of library research, but it was just amazing to me. They, they would cite this paper that, like, and they use the number, the wrong number so blatantly like anybody could have caught that mistake and you have to think that they were writing this in bad faith uh there's it's, no way they did that by accident so that concern is certainly there i something that i see a lot one of my least favorite arguments uh comes from the idea that well the magnetic field should be completely decayed uh mm -hmm. by now and thus the earth is quite young and and this comes from the idea that you take the current magnetic fields trend and you track it backwards and then, oh no, it, it's going to be too high. It, it, you know, it can only track backwards like 10,000 years or something along those lines. And it completely ignores this idea that the magnetic field is consistently in flux. And this is something that we can see in the iron of the crust of the earth as, as the magnetic field does indeed change. And it, it follows the, the dynamo that we know from, that we've known since like the seventies has been in effect, the dynamo of the earth's core. And it kind of, boggles my mind in the, in the same way that you're talking there, right? Like, I find it very difficult to believe that you can look into the magnetic field of the earth and how it's trending and why it's trending and not pick up on some of that. And in, in the same way with, with salinity in the seas, right? Like, how, how are you going to cite that paper and not pick up on the flux, the nature of the flux? Mm -hmm. So it, I don't know, that, that, that is concerning to me. I try to assume good faith uh, whenever I can, but Sometimes. Yeah. Well, that that approach resonates with their readers because they'll first they'll tell them like this is people think the earth is old because of uniformitarianism and they call it that because it sounds like a religious philosophy. And <laughs> that's a good it, point. At this point, like we are all obsessed with uniformitarianism and extrapolating constant rates or whatever back infinitely into the past. And, and so when they use this figure, uh, it resonates with the audience as something, I mean, it, it makes it appear as though they're using our own weapon against us, right? right. By, ex yeah. by assuming a constant rate over time, uh, even one that's shouldn't never, like there's no reason to assume it'd be constant. Um, it's, and it's it's funny with um, something like the magnetic field, the, they say we're extrapolating the recent trend, like what, since the 1960s? Like, well, right. what about since 1000 AD? Or 2000 AD, right. there is no long-term trend there. Like the, we we have documentation right. of, you know, we could reconstruct Earth's magnetic field well beyond the 1960s or 70s, uh, in especially in archaeological uh, pieces, right? Because the, the the strength is more or less preserved in in like clay-fired pots and and stuff like that. Other uh, geological examples. Uh, that's that's not my field, but um, I've I've gone through those papers before too, where they attempt to reconstruct the magnetic field through archaeological no, I'm, I'm finds. With you though, it doesn't. Through, 
yeah, cosmogenic isotopes and such. And it's it's really disingenuous. Again, it's like trying to argue that um, there's rapidly accumulating nitrogen in the ocean. It's like, well, do you know what fertilizer it is and when it was invented? Like, you can't extrapolate that beyond the agricultural, <laughs> industrial agricultural revolutions, right? Uh, it, I mean, it's like trying to argue based on the last 40 years of temperature trend that the earth was frozen a thousand years ago. Like, Right. You, you know, right. It's, another, it's, another we know that it doesn't extend all the way back a thousand years. It's, it's, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, another, it, it's hard because that's, that's one of the ways where they'll just make this ambiguous argument and, and on the surface, ostensibly, it looks like uh, it, they're using our own logic against us or something. And, yeah. and it's frustrating because you want, you want to, reach out to the people and say like can we just take a moment and do you, like learn something about this because it's really quite fascinating how it's we study cool. history of the magnetic field or the history of uh ocean chemistry and, and atmospheric composition and things like that it's right yeah it is fascinating so i i hate that that stumbling block is there I, I I do as well, and you know another another thing that I've seen just since we're on the topic of of kind of tr frequent tropes uh, in kind of the, the YUC um, literature, if you will, I see quite frequently as well uh, an exception in one form of one thing being you used as the rule to violate the general trend. So more recent ones that that has that I've seen that's been kind of rampant is. And again, bringing up limestone because I love limestone, but uh, limestone takes quite a long time to precipitate out of the water and accumulate on the seafloor, even in ideal conditions, which are warm and calm. And yet I've been seeing this citation quite a bit recently of, I, I believe I believe it was in Northern Europe of a, a power plant pumping CO2 into like water filled with limestone or filled with calcium carbonate and very quickly getting limestone. And that's, ah, yes, look at this. This, this is how it can form quickly. My thinking is, okay, so the Noachian deluge is what, injecting trillions of metric mm -hmm. tons of carbon, of CO2 oh, from yeah. well, the outside into the seas? Uh, also, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that, that's fine. It's it's funny because there's a natural analog for that and, and one that I study, and those are spring deposits where you have um, – because they have higher pressure CO2 at some depth, right? So the water that emerges has okay. relatively high CO2 content and it deposits calcite on the when, when it hits the surface because uh, for one, the water warms up and that CO2 has lower pressure on it so it can escape. That changes the pH and it forces uh, calcite precipitation. That I mean, there are lots of natural analogs anytime you have especially when you have hot springs, but even when you have cool springs, cool water springs. Um, but that doesn't form marine limestone. It forms distinct that travertine-like or tufa-like uh, sediment, which is totally different. Yeah. It looks different in the microscope. It looks different chemically. Uh, everything about it is quite unique. I mean, and it's like trying to take oh, yeah. their example from Mount St. Helens as though no geologist would know the difference between uh, volcanic stratigraphy versus i don't know <laughs> coastal basin stratigraphy i'm i feel so validated by you saying that because the first thing when when i first saw that paper the first thing i thought was i thought okay it's not biogenic we can tell the difference between biogenic limestone that's that's marine in nature um and and this analog that you're talking about and the, you're right the same thing is true i think the same thing quite frequently when saint helen mount saint helens is brought up it's like and, you know, to bring it to my my neck of the woods, so to speak, the same thing happens in paleontology. Like the, the impression that creationists, I feel, young earth creationists get of, of paleontology, but really bioanth as well, is that it, we pick up a skull, right? And we eyeball it and we say, hmm, it looks pretty transitional. We'll pot, toss it on the pile, put it on the line, you know, as, as if there's nothing more to it than that. And, and I get the feeling that it's very similar with geology. You know, you get these these folks who who are um, creationist geologists who are few and far between, but they do exist, and they're perhaps quite well versed in their area, or maybe not. I don't know, but, but they should know better. They should know that there's more to it than that. There's there's geochemistry. There's there's understanding 
the stratigraphy of the local area, what's been at play, the ecology, and how that impacts the conditions that were present. And I don't, it's again, and I hate to say it, but it's exactly what you said. It, it makes me worried about the good faith there. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, these, these are geologists whose application has massive implications for for the world with anything involving building things or drilling for things or um, just just a lot of human life requires a, a decent understanding of, of geology um, for those kinds of foundations. And the idea that these geologists just don't know what they're talking about and, and they get up there and they eyeball it and they say, well, this is a uniformitarianism. we got to keep big evolution, big. Yeah, that's, um, it, it is a big mis misunderstanding. Uh, it just, it's not hard to comprehend, but it just takes some commitment, like a small level of commitment to want to understand the topic. And I mean, th those I think are good examples. Like it, it, within five minutes, we can look at the techniques, the papers already published on this and how the magnetic field strength has varied over the last 2000 years instead of the sure. last hundred. And you can see there's, there's no long-term decay trend there. It goes up and down and uh, we can see that in recent history where everyone agrees it is history <laughs> that existed. Um, and you could do the same with oceans and such. I think uh, another common example, one I could show you is with the, the, the orbital forcing. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and for people not familiar, uh, there are variations in Earth's orbit over time, right? Yeah. It's, uh, so it's kind of cool how they work. It's actually, it's not that terribly difficult to understand, but there are several things. I'll, I'll focus on a couple here. Mm -hmm. uh, so Earth's tilt is more or less like this as this globe is so set up to show. Uh, and the current tilt is about 23.4 degrees. Right? Yeah. And the tilt will vary plus or minus about one degree. Right, so it tilts this way and that. Uh, there's also a precessional cycle uh, that is more difficult, I think, to understand, but it's, it's really not that bad. Um, so we know that Earth's orbit varies throughout time. Uh, we, we can hypothesize that it varies throughout time just on basic physics of how gravity affects planetary bodies like this. Uh, but the basic hypothesis is this, uh, the seasons change from year to year uh, because when you're over on this side of the sun and the sun's shining this way, part of the planet is tilted away from it. And then as the earth orbits around on the other side, now it's tilted toward and we get warmer temperatures and it comes back around, it's tilted away, right? So we're familiar with that. The seasons don't happen because the earth is going like this and it's where it happens because right. it's moving from one side to other and it has that uh, slight tilt in its orbit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what's interesting about this, the it's, it's the gravitational pull between earth and sun that's keeping the earth in orbit, uh, which has a, a, a very small side impact. And that is that the earth is not a perfect sphere, right? Mm -hmm. It's got a little bulge at the center. It's got some- uh, oh, a spheroid. <laughs> it's got some love handles here. Uh, and and <laughs> the, the implication of that, um, actually, I guess I could just show you here. Yeah, let me share this instead. Yeah, the globe might get hard to mimic processions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there you go. Right, so what happens because you got this little bulge here, it's not huge, it's you know it's 20 something kilometers at the equator, uh, but it's just enough to add a little bit extra mass. And because this part of the earth is closer to the sun than this part, well, when it is, uh, it pulls a little bit harder on this side of the earth than it does on this side of the earth. And that applies a torque force, right? But because the earth is in rotation, uh, there's an angular momentum that needs to be conserved. And the result of that is that the, ooh, now I can show you this way. The result of that is that the orbit or the, uh, the axis on which Earth uh, rotates will twist around in time like this, right? And it doesn't twist by much, like over the entirety of your lifetime, no matter how old you are, it hasn't moved enough to actually visualize. And right. to go from this position here to this position here takes about 11,000 years. Okay. And another 11,000 years to get back to this position here. And what that means is that um, when you're on 
you know, in, in the modern configuration, for example, uh, we're, you know, tilted, if you're in North America, for example, in Northern Hemisphere, you're tilted away from the sun in um, wintertime. And then when you're on this side, you tilt it toward the sun in the summertime. Yeah. Uh, another factor that though is that Earth's orbit itself is elliptical. So at one part of the year, we are closer to the sun than the other part. Right, and the, with the current setup, we're closer to the sun in January than we are in July. So uh, today, winters are relatively mild in the Northern Hemisphere and right. relatively colder in the Southern Hemisphere, just from that factor alone compared to 11,000 years ago. And then right. they'll switch back and forth. Uh, so at any given latitude uh, of Earth, you can calculate how uh, incoming solar radiation will vary through time, right? Uh, as that precession cycle switches the, the slight configuration of the Earth around. Uh, so we can make a hypothesis though, and this is we get back into uniformitarianism. Uh, we can make a hypothesis that this process, that the, this gravitational pull function the same way as it does today, um, you know, through, yeah, through whatever period of the past, right? Uh, and if that's the case, then we can hypothesize that 11,000 years ago, the setup would be like this and uh, there should be a very different gradient in the amount of sunlight, or amount of solar radiation from one latitude to the next. Uh, so we can, let's, let's go back and I will show you how we could test this. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is, this is kind of, that's kind of blowing my mind uh, that, that using the precession of earth and its axis tilt that we can actually measure that through time that's seeing that cycle through the rocks is that's pretty damning <laughs> yeah well so here's an example just uh, from the monsoon and it's just a cartoon of how the monsoon works um so sure it's a little more complicated but the basic concept is that in summertime uh imagine this is uh southeast asia for example land sure. surface there it's it's fairly low latitude and in summertime the land surface heats up much faster than the ocean does and in winter, it cools off a lot faster than the ocean does. So the temperature gradient from land to ocean changes quite a bit throughout the year from one season to the next. Uh, and this changes the general pattern of the winds, first of all, the convection, uh, how much precipitation and is, is evaporated and how much precipitation falls. Uh, so the whole water cycle is affected. And in the summertime, that what it tends to do is bring a lot of moisture from the, the nearby oceans on land. Now the strength of this convective cell, the, the overall strength and size of the convection uh, can depend on you know, incoming solar radiation. So if we have a period where solar radiation is stronger overall, uh, we would expect this cell to expand. There's more latent heat export from the uh, tropics, more evaporation, uh, stronger overall uh, precipitation around yeah. here. And the, the net effect, what that does, one way to test it is through the oxygen isotope signal in speleothems, right? So these will accumulate. This cave is not in China. This is from Russia, but um, uh, there are plenty of Chinese caves where we can test this. So this is solar insulation based on that uh, processional cycle. Uh, and here I have it for 30 degrees north, and here I have it for 30 degrees south. So 30 degrees north latitude um, today, it's relatively low compared to some 10,000 years ago, 11,000 right. 11, years ago. And then it went down and then up and then down, up and down, right? Now this is a hypothesis. Like we, we reconstruct this just from pure physics and modeling how Earth's orbit looked in the past, in this case, the past 100,000 years. Right. Now in the Southern hemisphere, it's the opposite as I mentioned, right? So in the summer, Southern hemisphere, it's relatively stronger today or the last couple thousand years have been stronger. Right. Uh, whereas in the past it was weaker and stronger than weaker, stronger and weaker. So we can look at oxygen isotope signals from both regions, both monsoon regions. And we'll start with the uh, Amazon basin here. How, you know, we can hypothesize that that oxygen isotope signal should follow this trend more or less because it modulates the strength and size of that monsoon convective cell. Does that make sense? That's insane. That's so, so if, we plot, <laughs> if we plot cave data from Brazil, uh, for example, it looked like this. And there's that consistent lag, you see? Yeah. 
the lag itself driven um, most likely by glacial advance and decay, which takes some time. Yeah, no, that, that checks but, out. You, yeah, that makes sense. But there's the pattern. And in the Northern hemisphere, it should be opposite, right? And it is. Yeah, there it is. So here's Brazil, here's China. So, so yeah, so the, let me, let me make sure that, let me make sure that I'm getting this correctly. So, so the, the change in the, the change in the precession and the wobble of the earth mm -hmm. is essentially leaving its mark in the signatures, the geologic signatures of these cave formations. And right. the north reflects the opposite of the south, the inverse of the south. So as to confirm the hypothesis that this is indeed how the earth has been moving in the past, not just how it is now, and not just the trajectory that it is now. Correct. Is that, that, so, oh my God, that's, that's insane. How, how could you possibly? Well, I mean, if you are a young earth ministry and you want to community, you want to talk about this uh, orbital cycle, uh, generally you describe it as just in a uniformitarian assumption. Like we, you know, we, we calculate from physics how this might have been in the past, but we don't right. just stop there. I mean, it, it's, it's a hypothesis at that point. And, and this is one way to test it. It's very straightforward. Um, and I'm just giving you a very focused example. I mean, there are hundreds, thousands of papers we could go through uh, giving similar results. But the, so the, the thing that, that that that's like blowing my mind, though, that that seems it seems that that is such a brute, that's such a brute issue. Well, it is. I mean, that's why I would share it now, because you can you can find this paper, uh, right. go look it up and, and see the results. But I'll, I'll give you another example just from China. Uh, this is, as I've got it labeled here, stronger monsoon, weaker monsoon, based on the oxygen isotope ratio in speleothems. Uh, and this is how we know that it uh, responds, for example, in the modern day, it, it responds this way and, you know, physical models and so forth. Uh, that's the general relationship between the two. So this is solar insulation, um, or sorry, incoming solar radiation uh, for June at 30 degrees north latitude, right? So that's southeastern yeah. China. Uh, right. This is how we hypothesize it would work using uh, the mechanics of orbital forcing. And here are the raw data. <laughs> That's so cool. And so keep in mind, the way we know, like if we want to know uh, this layer from that particular speed of how old that is, so we, we use that uranium thorium dating method. So this is reconstructed based on uranium thorium dating. That uh, orange line is reconstructed based on you know, what we know about physics and, and gravity. <laughs> I, uh, it's so cool too, that that even shows the lag, like I was just leaning in to see if I could see the lag that you were just uh -huh. mentioning too. And, and you're, you can see it here, it's it's slight because I think we're zoomed out, but that's still so cool. Mm -hmm. I, I, it had never even occurred to me that people have done this, that, but that's so, because I guess it seemed in two, I, I'd taken it for granted that it was always thought that this that are these orbital mechanics kind of work the same way. But mm -hmm. what a what a cool way to to cross check it. Yeah, I mean they they don't work the same way, and it's different at different latitudes. We can sure. hypo hypothesize further that uh, that lag time, like I mentioned, that lag to what produces it could be. Um, other atmospheric dynamics or oceans or, or ocean currents catching up or something like that. We can hypothesize a number of dynamics uh, and then go to test that. So one way to look at it would be, what is the lag like in the monsoon system here in the tropics? What is the lag like up here right. in the high latitudes or the mid latitudes? Uh, and in conditions you could say, well, we would expect that it would look something like this and then check it again. Right. And for those high, say those high latitudes, mid latitudes, say Western Europe and Scandinavia, um, it's interesting. The lag is greater uh, when you get closer to that ice sheet in Scandinavia, and it drops away as you get farther away. Oh, that's that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Well, we we have talked about a lot, and we're at about an hour and thirty eight minutes. Would you be able yeah, to answer questions? Sure. I don't okay. have a way to see them, I think. So oh, do, I will read them out loud. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> um, Just to let you know. Like, yeah, we, we had two super chats. We had one from, where they're both from Vindalia 1998. So I'll read those first. Vindalia 1998, I don't think he's here. I think he had to go into work. But he says, how many people did you trample on the way to get to the top, Erica? Uh, too many. 
<laughs> you know, I'm a savage. Um, let me see here. Okay. Captain, oh wait, uh, let me back up a little bit more because I checked. I had asked earlier in the side chat what some of our questions were going to be. And, okay, I think Gargoyle already asked that one. And, okay. In Dolly1998, super, second Super Chat says, I wish I could stay to the end but have to go to work. My question is, what is your favorite geological time and any reason why it is your favorite? Favorite geological time? Mm-hmm. I don't know that I've ever thought of that. <laughs> like, I really haven't. Okay, which one's the coolest to study? Uh, well, sure, when you put it that way. I, I've become more biased toward the Holocene, and maybe it's because... You live in it. <laughs> no, not, not even that. It's, it's because you can see things at such fine scale. Right. You can plot these details at such fine scale that it, it, it becomes more interesting to test the questions. So it's very different from studying like the Neoproterozoic, which is a fascinating time period uh, between that global, uh, sorry, that snowball earth uh, event and the beginning of the Cambrian, right? And that, that's a really fascinating period because animals emerge, uh, you've got all things that are going on in terms of uh, earth, uh, global earth cycles and um, global, sorry, global chemical cycles in terms of evolution, in terms of the fossil record. And I, th there are a lot of aspects of study, but it's so, damn difficult yeah. because the records are so distant yeah they're, they're few and far between and um you lose a lot of the resolution the proxies uh, don't all work uh, as well you, i mean which means maybe you don't have you know nice calcifying organisms that leave behind shells with perfect perfect chemistry that you can study uh, a lot has happened right. to those rocks since they were deposited uh, mm -hmm. and so it's a fascinating period, but the picture is, you have to be satisfied with a blurry picture. And when yeah. you get to something like the Holocene and I'd say not just the Holocene, like the last 130,000 years, just not defined as a specific epic, but um, MIS six to one, <laughs> that's what we call it. Marine isotope stage six until present because you have so much variability over that time period. Uh, and you can address all these questions in super fine resolution. I mean, have a right. cave samples, which I, where I showed you earlier, we can look at one year to the next preserved within cave samples. And that's true within other geological proxies too, like uh, certain types of lakes and, and trees and whatever. But I, I like that you can look at it in such fine scale. Uh, and one thing we didn't talk about yet is we, um, you can also look at it in, through climate models in very fine detail uh, in, in yeah. those events like the, the Younger Dryas event or that, that cooling event since uh, random climate events or that are abrupt. So you can model those out and then test your, te I mean, test those models against your geological proxy data. And, you know, that, that will help you or it will elucidate whether the physical processes you think were responsible for these geochemical anomalies were actually responsible. Uh, and that was one thing we did too. Uh, we compared model data for our cave site uh, for the actual data we came up with and, and found that they matched perfectly. Um, and, and that was a good way to corroborate our hypothesis about why there was a long-term trend that we found. You know. I, I have to imagine, too, that it's it's nice to be able to cross-check with things like dendrochronology and coral clocks that are maybe still actually growing rather than ones that have been, um, that are kind of uh, shadows of their former selves. Like, it, it almost seems like you just have more options to kind of say, well, all right, we're, we're seeing the, the signature in, you know, in, in our ice cores, like, say, the, the eight, I believe you said 8.2 thousand years ago about the cooling period. So you might want to say, okay, well, maybe we can look to some of the dendrochronology records that we have of, of you know, trees that have are, are still kind of around, but formed rings during that time period, or coral clocks that are still obviously in active growth because they grow for so dang long. Um, it, it must be nice to be able to have those options. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, that's great okay because the, the geological record is well preserved since then. And with that particular cooling event, I mean, it's hypothesized that this happened because uh, big, big parts of the Canadian, the, that Laurentide ice sheet over Canada, uh, big parts of that melted, broke off, uh, formed lakes that actually more or less dammed lakes that broke loose. Sure. And there was a sudden influx of fresh water to the North Atlantic, and that affected the salinity gradients and other things that uh, slowed down certain currents and slowed down the or cooled off the whole region, right? Yeah. And and so that's it sounds like a cool hypothesis, but you can test that in so many ways, uh, looking at proxies for ocean currents, uh, looking at proxies for temperature here and there, changes in vegetation, also looking for evidence of lots of fresh water suddenly flowing into the Atlantic, into the Caribbean, and we find that, right? Um, you can look for those lake beds and, uh, you know, where did the lake stop existing? You know, it yeah. stopped existing between 8.2 and 8, 4, 8. 4,000 years ago. Uh, a lot of these lake beds in, in Canada, right? So when you date them by radiocarbon, you see that the lake suddenly disappeared about then. Um, and you Is put it all those together, right? Isn't it a bummer when a cool hypothesis gets busted by data? <laughs> I, I had my fingers crossed for a gamma ray burst in the Triassic, but I don't think it's going to pan out. <laughs> Smitty asks in the side chat, um, and I believe we already covered this, so I, I don't think you have to answer again, but Smitty asked, how fast can glaciers be laid down under perfect conditions? Mm -hmm. so, I mean, well, keep in mind, you can get, um, and there are places where you can get several feet or several meters of snow uh, accumulated, that gets compacted down quite a bit. So, you know, a few feet of snow doesn't mean a few feet of glacier. But, right. um, and, and people will point to, you know, the case where uh, it looks like something fairly new was buried under a lot of snow or something like this. They really don't get laid down that fast. I mean, there are parts of Greenland, for example, where you get lots of snow because it's just the right temperature. It's not, it's, it's close to freezing. So, uh, it's not like Antarctica where it's more or less a desert, but most of most of Greenland is much drier, much higher elevation, and that limits growth even more, right? So around the margins, uh, you can get a lot of snow, but you, that's not where glaciers accumulate. It's not around the margin of the glacier, it's in the center. And yeah. you have to keep in mind, these are like mountains. At their peak, they are mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Laurentide Ice Sheet over Canada was um, more than two kilometers thick. They're big honking structures. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so two, two to three kilometers, 2,000 3, meters, that's a good size mountain. Right. Uh, and it's that thick over a big portion of the continent. So when you're up that high, I mean, just think about in any alpine scenario, uh, the amount of precipitation that you can have at those elevations goes down and down and down, right? Significant. Yeah, the, yeah at that limits a lot. <laughs> yeah, so the bigger it gets, the slower it can grow, put it that yeah. way. Yeah, you've got, like, in, yeah, I, I can see that. I had never considered, this This has been such a cool conversation too. Like we really have some of the end of my new show, which is exactly what I wanted. I So many things I hadn't considered. Not Air only that, but the uh, glaciers uh, interrupt atmospheric flow as well. And that's yeah. that's one thing we test for, it's really cool. And they, they act like mountains and they will divert yeah. atmospheric flow and modify position of the jet stream, for example, the position of those storm tracks, and that can work against them. In fact, the last ice age, the ice sheet in North America is much larger than the one in Canada, uh, sorry, in Scandinavia. And the reason for that is this one got so big in North America that it caused the jet stream to wave and tilt up in a certain way that it couldn't grow as much in Eurasia. Oh, it limited my. growth in Eurasia. But you have the opposite configuration in the previous um, uh, previous ice age. Yeah, so going on. One, yeah, one grew faster than the other. And they were actually affecting each other by modifying the jet stream position and how much moisture was being um, uh, transported to the respective ice sheets. That, that's that's just so cool. I, I want to make sure we get through some of these questions because yeah, I, cool. I, I like there's so many questions I have about that because we didn't yet like I want to dig into the glaciers more, but I, mean, I might just have to coerce you to come back on at some point because people are really loving this we've we've got up to about 70 people watching concurrently which is pretty good i mean that's that's awesome airbender 72 at, says not entirely relevant but i would love to know jonathan's favorite dinosaur favorite ape and favorite rock these are all important things for people to know <laughs> <laughs> 
tell your preferences. <laughs> I, I'll have to get back to you on that one, sure. <laughs> I, I really don't know. I, I never thought about those questions, and especially not favorite rocks or favorite minerals. I, I, I'm not much of a favorite person. <laughs> Just, oh, my Say, you know, I see. You can't ask me those kinds of questions because I'll be like, I couldn't possibly choose. Here's a hundred things I like about all the dinosaurs, all the apes, and I'm all. I'm not the even sure what criteria I would use. That's that's the hard part. Honestly. Right, like easy to study versus looks cool versus you know sentimental value. I guess like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, carbonates. For example, I, I've studied carbonates for mo most of my graduate career, and and sure that maybe I could say that that's. A favorite in a way, but at the same time, it's really not like trying to crawl through caves. Is it can be kind of a pain? Like it's super slippery, and there are places where if you slip in the wrong place, you're you're not coming back. <laughs> and uh, so, and yeah. outside, like especially here in semi-arid um, parts of the world, if you're studying limestone, like sure they're all exposed, but man, that stuff is sharp, I and it's hard to climb on. It's a big pain. If you slip, like you can cut yourself pretty bad. Uh, my undergrad advisor called them MFCs. The C stands for carbonate. And <laughs> I, thought, I thought you said MSCs and I was like, oh, yeah, F MFCs. Yeah, that one I that one I can uh mm -hmm. I think I can put two and two together. <laughs> yeah, so they're fascinating from a research perspective, but they're huge pain to deal with in nature. So I don't know how how I'd really decide. I mean I, I'm probably more interested favorite rock would be granites they're pretty i like them we we joke in uh primatology that you know at, when i was doing my thesis it involves a lot of species and i asked my supervisor i was like okay you know i've got this this morphologic data on like all of these different african colobin species but i can't find anything on their behavior like it, why can't i find anything and he was like well it's like they all live in the swamp and no one wants to go research them <laughs> and i was like okay that checks out it's kind of yeah. funny the bias uh, is always on the stuff that's fun or easy to study. So it's, it's interesting. Scott Duke and uh, Richie Estrada, I believe, uh, in Richie Estrada in a super chat, they both ask a similar question, which is uh, for, for both of us, but mostly you, I, I think in this case, what books do you recommend for laymen that are interested in paleontology and geology? Um... In general, uh, where'd it go? I mean, I, so for paleontology and geology, uh, especially paleontology, Donald Prothero's books um, are great, especially oh. because he has a lot of these questions in mind when he's writing. Uh, so he's one of those that's he's not doing it explicitly always. But anticipating critical minds, yes, know, who are thinking about paleontology and such. So I, I think he was uh, a good one to read. Uh, if you're actually just general geology, but especially if you have any knowledge of, you know, the young earth controversy and such, then read um, the Bible Rocks in Time. I have that right behind my computer. I have it right here. This this book is fantastic. I, I bring it up all the time on the channel mm -hmm. because. It really is so good for for not just if you're interested in the geology, which which I'm very interested in the geology, but it's got some very interesting uh, theology takes in there too that I, I thought were really cool. And I don't know, the yeah. guy seems unique. I want to add to that as well uh, because uh, Ken Wolgmuth is actually in the chat and he's one of the authors on uh, um, Grand Canyon Grand Monument Grand to the Ancient Earth, <laughs> which, yeah, I, which I have a copy of and I've reviewed and, and it's excellent. Um, that, that was the next one I was going to mention. Uh, just because it takes an example like Grand Canyon where people oversimplify it uh, inadvertently. Like if you're just going to visit, people can oversimplify it because the geology there is relatively simple. But uh, they do a great job in that book of looking at those minutia, right? And, and the little details, uh, the fact that there's another mile thick uh, sequence below the Grand Canyon, which is not flat. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's a great book because you could take there that you know that classic Young Earth example where the, like I said, it's one of the few places where you can make this look plausible, and, and they go into a lot of detail. So it, it's it's a great introduction, not only to like stratigraphy and sedimentology, but also um, 
to your morphology, like how the canyons formed since then, and it's it's perfect. I will ruthlessly pick your brain just as I have with Jonathan. <laughs> we have some more questions. Let's see. We already did that by Scott. We have, let's see, keep on moving. Let's keep it going down. I know I saw another one down here because there were quite a few. Why not? <laughs> Foppish dilettante took your took your um your favorite rock claim and said a chunk of marble told Leonardo don't take me for granted. <laughs> so you know that's your punishment for not having a <laughs> listening to that pun is your punishment for not having one right off the top of your head. <laughs> I'll think about um, it next time. Those questions. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm I'm dying to know your favorite your favorite ape because that's my uh that's my <laughs> that's my forte. <laughs> I although to be fair I don't know that I could name my favorite rock I think I would say I think I would just go general and say limestone because I, I think limestone is awesome and I love that it's made up of uh, microorganisms sometimes and that you can kind of track your way through geologic columns using it I think that's just uh, very very cool um well while we're waiting for some more questions to come in because uh, we've only got you for like five or ten more minutes <laughs> very little time if that's okay. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I, I will ask you one of one of my questions because I I had one more as well um, with regard to limestone because I I love limestone for the third time. But I I took some calculations for or I took some yeah some calculations from like Updike and Wilkinson. They've been cited quite a bit. I think they have like a 1993 paper, and the the best I could do for getting formations like chalk balls or even just um, mixed limestone beds was like maybe maybe three feet in a year, two, three feet in a year, if you had like optimal conditions. Do you think that was a fair assessment? Um, you say for rates of accumulation of limestone? Yes, for like biogenic limestone. I think I based it off of like Bahama Banks accumulation today. Uh, if you can keep in mind a couple of things, one is that, uh, the limestone is going to compact substantially as it dewaters, right. as it gets uh, buried and, and compressed. And that Think process that. will occur that the same if it's done gradually as if it is done very rapidly. Uh, if you keep a lot of water buried, I mean, you can't escape so easily through the substrate, for example, if it accumulates too fast. And by too fast, I mean more than, you know, I mean, not feet per year, but feet per day or feet per hour kind of scenario, which is, I think, what they would envision, right? Um, right. I mean, there's a limit. There are two limits here. One in how much sediment you could physically transport. Uh, and that one is not met. I mean, it's, it's not even possible to transport that much sediment, assuming it were already formed and existing right. somewhere. Uh, so it's kind of a moot point to talk about how fast this can accumulate naturally. But yeah, in, in, a, in a setting like Bahama Banks, sure, that's probably as, as good as it can get or more optimal conditions. We got warm waters uh, where it's potentially alkaline enough and, and oxygenated enough, well mixed and such uh, to, to promote more rapid calcite precipitation. But um, there, there are feedbacks there too. I mean, if it happens too fast, you you got to think about the pH of the water. You got to think about the availability of um, bicarbonate and nutrients and, and all these other things. And 
it's really not that, I mean, it can't be much faster in the end than something like that. So I, right. a lot of these formations are super thin. I mean, one that I studied, for example, only covers a small snippet, like a few million years in the Cambrian. And this is like 500 meters thick. Golly. Uh, yeah, and that's I mean that's just one small formation, one part, one small part of the Cambrian. Um, yeah. Trying to add everything else in them, and there are others where uh, canyons here where you can walk through. It's it's great because the uh, the layers are tilted just about like this, and so you could walk through the canyon. It's very <laughs> easy to trace them one by right. one. You don't even have to <laughs> climb; you can just look at them side by side. Uh, but I mean, this will go on for a mile or so, and and you're covering, you know part of the Mississippian. Like this is not a whole geologic column. This is just a small sampling. Uh, so the amount of limestone that we have, which itself only makes up like a quarter of the geologic mass, I mean, a sedimentary rock mass. Right. In the surface, like it's... Uh, yeah, it's... I I found a couple of different that's I think that's generally it though most of the measurements that I felt like how are you going to measure the percentage of limestone on everything like with super precise <laughs> but yeah, it's something it has, uh, most of that limestone by the way I mean some limestone looks very different when it's accumulating rapidly in a surface setting like Bahama Banks uh, in you know a near coast uh, sorry a near shore environment uh, right. versus in a deeper water environment where it's more calm. You know, the kind of environment where crinoids can grow and, yeah. uh, or even deeper than that. Uh, it, it, the limestone itself looks different in texture. It looks different in the types of fossils and such. Uh, and the maximum rates at which those can accumulate are quite different as well. But, I hadn't even considered the difference between deep sea versus shore. I should have, I should have, we should have done this call before my limestone video day. It, I should have. No, that's, that's fine. Um, and I think what, what well, certainly people like Answers Genesis will focus a lot on uh, very near shore limestones where the grains are large because they're formed by organisms more rapidly than a lot of those deeper water limestones, which uh, are yeah, under calm waters. And, but, but here's the thing, any sequence you study, almost any sequence, uh, you'll get a layer like this of deep water limestone, a layer like this of shallow water limestone and then deep layer and so forth. They'll kind of go back and forth, uh, not just in the texture, but the organisms that are preserved inside and often even the chemistry, so. Yeah, that I, yeah, that's so cool. I knew about some of the chemistry stuff, but man, that is that is amazing. And Nikithera for $5, thank you for your super chat, um, says, What's one thing you wish you you wish everyone knew about geology that would help them get perspective on all of the insanity going on in the world? So what, what's your geology wisdom that you could, if given the opportunity, impose on everyone? <laughs> That's uh, creative. Do we know what the insanity in the world is referring to or? I don't know. I think I mean, it would depend. This is like geology to help settle the political atmosphere or to like, um, <laughs> or crazy I, things that people believe about the earth or I don't know I mean I, I suppose you could pick any of them you wanted I, I, I imagine geology would certainly help using geology to help with climate change I'm sure that would help elucidate some stuff for people who mm -hmm. maybe don't know more about it but I'm not sure what this is in reference to general insanity I suppose you can just do impose whichever insanity you think is being referred to I, I'm cool I, with that I think um I mean, the biggest key is that uh, in geology, the more you learn, the more you don't know. That's mm -hmm. how it feels. And I think my advisor told me that is like, once you get to the point, uh, or I, I think I told him, like, I feel like the more I try to research this, or the more I read about it, the, the more questions I have, the less I know. And it's like, good, you're finally learning something. <laughs> like, the humility. I mean, when you feel like okay. you're going backwards, that's when you know, that's when you're finally progressing. And that that's the biggest thing. Um, the Earth is dynamic and complex. I mean, there, there's so many different systems uh, connected together, and that's especially true and helpful if you're talking about climate. Um, you know, the Earth is not a terrarium in your garage under a heat lamp, and so climate change isn't right. as simple as turning the light on and off. Uh, I mean, there are massive systems that move 
heat around the planet, that move moisture around the planet, that move sediments and all these other things around the planet. And uh, you can get appreciation for this, I think, just looking at uh, local geological histories. And, uh, go check out the um, local geology of Nepal or the Tibetan Plateau, right? And it's just the, the complexity of the history there is astounding. And then go to Estonia, you know, right. and, and check out geological history there. And uh, I think looking around the world like that, you can get an appreciation for just how complex this is. Uh, get away from the textbook notion where, you know, you see a cross section of a famous national landmark and that's the geological yeah. exposure you get. Yeah, yeah it's, um, I think the best thing I could show is just a cross section in places like the Appalachians. That would be so the, I mean, the complexity of the folds or, or Western Wyoming, Eastern Idaho, for example, the complexity of the folds, uh, the structure, underneath there is just so ridiculous uh, that you can come to appreciate immediately just how much work went into building the geologic column. By work, I mean lots of motion and time, lots of processes. That's I, that's eloquent as it comes for, for describe the dynamism of the, of the world we live in. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have time for one more question? Mm -hmm. All right. Beach Price says, does Jonathan keep, I, I think this is an interesting one. Uh, does Jonathan keep track of what they find out about Mars and how it may teach us about Earth? Probably in reference to the geologic activity on Mars. Yeah, um, I'm really bad at that. I had colleagues uh, who, <laughs> I mean, I had colleagues who were at um, the forefront of a lot of that research, especially analyzing Mars analog environments uh, and you know, a lot of their work actually went into some of the planning for what kind of samples we're going to take from Mars. Uh, so that was really That's exciting cool. to see them progress in that. It was it was never my thing. I don't know why. I just I I I don't have a specific interest in planetary geology, as it's called, or in this case, it should be archaeology because you know geology means like the Earth. Yeah. And you can't have geology of another planet that's not the Earth. So technically, it'd be like archaeology or something. Anyways. Uh, th that aside, like, I, yeah, I didn't, I, I do kind of keep track and luckily from a number of friends who post on that, um, they've got a sharper interest in it. I mean, it's, I just haven't dug into it much, but it has been quite impressive to see like the complexity of Martian geology, so to speak. Uh, just, you know, the fact that you see formation, like what, what we always kind of imagine is this blank planet, like, oh, nothing ever happened there because yeah. everything's happening here. Uh, of course, it's going to be more complicated than that, and there's a lot to learn, but uh, it, it wasn't until you start seeing some of the high-res images of the last decade up close, uh, looks at its stratigraphy and the type of sediment that's on the surface, so you realize there's a story there that we, we really know nothing about. Uh, yeah, so potentially super fascinating, but I'm not the one to ask. I, I don't keep up with it. I rely on a lot of other people to do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's good to have people who are a little closer to it too because that way you can be like take take the complex and make it digestible to me <laughs> i rely on that i'm relying on that here so okay i think i think that's gonna do it we've kept you here for two hours and seven minutes and it has been an absolute only blast. Been two hours <laughs> it, flies, it flies by i'm I, I looked up at the clock at one point because I, I wasn't keeping track and and we were about an hour and probably 20 minutes in and I was like, it feels like we've been talking for about 10 minutes. So in, yeah, I still feel like we barely scraped the surface. You know, I mean, God, you could talk for forever about this kind of stuff. And I, I learned a lot. I, you know, I was kind of, I, I guess I was thinking I would learn some, but I just, I, geology is such an area that's foreign to me. I learned way more than, than I thought I would, but thank you everyone. Um, you can find all of Jonathan's links in the description and, uh, you know, if, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like or a comment. And if we get enough likes and comments, which is to, up to my discretion, then I'll, I'll try to coerce Jonathan coming back on sometime. So, <laughs> Well, that would be really tough to coerce me to come back on because this is, no, I'm just going to, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and I think you have a great channel, so I'm glad to be here. And oh, if anytime you've got more questions, I'm happy to try and answer. <laughs> Listen, now that I know of your your connection to limestone, you might not <laughs> you might not be able to stop the, 
the flood of questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end the broadcast now. So uh, thank you again, everyone, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. All right.